Hey, uh, this is Anosai, which you might know as the guy who makes all the videos on this channel. And with me today is... Kurt Harland Larson. Uh, who you may know from Information Society or as a games musician. Indeed. Which I've featured a few times on this channel. Mostly this interview is going to be about the uh, game stuff, but there is one Information Society thing I really wanted to ask about. Cool. The question I have written down is, how did collaboration work in a band in the 80s? And that might be a broad question, so I kind of want to elaborate. You mean like, how did I and my uh, bandmate work together to make music? And your producer. That's also what I'm curious about. Because mm -hmm. like these days, it, you can just be one person in a bedroom with Ableton Live, yeah. and you can make a song start to finish, mm -hmm. nobody else involved. And if you want to collaborate, I've done that too. I'll just send the Ableton file back and forth and right. just add to it. You, you can't do that in the 80s. Not in that way, but I mean, we started in 1982 and uh, Paul was already making music by that point. So he started doing it in 81 and uh, he was making songs start to finish all by himself. You know, it was just different, different technology. Um, it had a lot less flexible capability we could do far fewer things with it uh but we weren't sitting around saying gee i wish it could do all these different things that that now we can do we just thought oh well this is what we have so this is what we can make um at that time of course there was a huge 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 difference in what you could do and how it sounded if you were working at home by yourself compared to what you would get if you went into a studio and worked with a bunch of people i mean the, the difference was extreme you know dem that's why people talked about demo tapes you know that you say that because you know what it's going to sound like it's going to be noisy the song quality is going to be low the songs are going to be simplistic instrumentation etc you have to assume that you're hearing something that's just a sketch of a song whereas in the studio you'd come up with something that sounded more complete and higher quality and as you're pointing out um that's just not as true today you, people any reasonably experienced and technically competent uh artist can by her or himself at home make an album that sounds as professional and as you know technically high quality as anything else um sometime you know between the early 90s and the late o's there was a slow transition in the role of in the roles of producers from the people who really had to coordinate all of the difficult technical and organizational work that it took to make music in the studio to more of a an artistic collaborator which they all uh, frequently they were that always anyway too yeah that was another question i had because i remember you uh you worked with joy beltran and carl bartos how much of that was them like managing all this technical stuff and how much of it was like a creative collaboration kind of thing yeah it was you know every producer was different but uh the role was it, it varied a lot some producers were mostly creative only and and they would have people who worked with them to handle the more mundane and technical aspects. And some producers handled the whole thing start to finish and everything in between. Um, we worked with a number of different producers and they were all different. Our primary producer was Fred Maher, who was the producer for all of uh, the first two Warner Brothers albums. And um, but also, you know, very important in those projects was the role of the engineer who kind of was the buffer between the producer and the, you know, the constant technical tedium, right? Uh, you'd have, you have, a, you'd have a recording engineer who would be the one who would have to do things like swap out the tapes and make sure all the levels were right. And, oh, let me check this channel because the compressor has a noise in it and blah, blah, blah. So that the producer could still have conversations with the artist about the song and his head didn't have to go totally into just making the studio function um i see i see but he nonetheless was working on both levels you know he had to and producers have to worry about things like making sure the studio gets their their check you know right and scheduling and things like that yeah i'm just trying to wrap my head around it because i know it was so different back then yeah it was very very but i'm also know it's not going to be like all right you get a producer in here and they produce all the track except the vocals and they just say here you go sing on top of this i don't think that's how that worked well that would happen too remember the the word producer can mean a lot of different things yeah that's the problem there were plenty of people in the 80s who were known as quote producers end quote 
But the way they worked was they knew how to make a song start to finish pretty much by themselves, like you were saying earlier. Um, and they wanted to work with vocalists. So you'd have the person who did all the tracks and the person who sang the songs, and they would switch around with different singers, maybe. Stuff like that. I mean, you know, you, you remember the act uh, CNC Music Factory. It was, I believe, two guys who um, were proficient in the studio, and they, you know, reached out for uh, performers and vocalists to work with, and they called themselves producers. But there's also plenty of bands who worked exactly the same way. You know, one person would do all the tracks and another person would do all the vocals and lyrics and stuff. And they just didn't call themselves a producer, even though maybe they were. Yeah, that sounds more traditional. Although my understanding is that I think it was mostly you and Paul that was kind of would mm -hmm. be the producer in Information Society. Is that right? Well, Paul more than me. But yeah. Uh, but, you know, going back in time a little uh, at that point, because of the difference in the technology, even even we really needed a producer to handle the you know the broad and deep scope of mechanical and technical issues that you had to deal with to make an album back then. And when I say make an album, I don't mean any way you can. I mean when you've got Warner Brothers dumping what in today's dollars would be more than half a million on recording your album, and you had to make sure that that money was well spent. I mean, we didn't have the experience to make sure that that would happen. Um, Fred did. And Fred worked closely with the label to make sure everything worked smoothly. You just don't have the kind of money risk now that you had back then. And that's the biggest change from all the technology. You can Somebody who has a few thousand dollars worth of software and a decent computer can make a professional sounding album now. Back then we spent, you know, 1987, dollars, $250,000 making that first album. And that wasn't even a huge budget. Right. So are you more on the um, just one computer and a couple thousand dollars of software today? Yeah, I mean, Paul is the one who records the tracks now. I sort of um, f faded out of uh, recording tracks, you know, you know, like almost 20 years ago now. Um, and now I only do uh, lyrics, vocals, melody in our, in our songs. Okay, yeah, that kind of I mean, that kind of lines up with what I think I've seen. I yeah. wrote the music for one song on our last album, you know, just because one day I felt inspired. And I just recorded an extremely crude track for Paul to listen to. And I said, hey, let's make this into a song. He's the one who had to take it and make it sound like something. You know, uh, I see. For me, it was just a few notes going bink, bink, bink. How would we did a song like that? You know? Yeah, I've, I've, been in that, I've been in that position. Yeah. Although I'm usually more of the, you know, I, I like a lot of the, you know, sound creation part of music. So I tend to be a bit more of the producer hat, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I went way into sound design as well, um, partially. I mean, I was always kind of leaning that way. Uh, and then when I started working on games, uh, I went that way much, even much further. So your original question was like, how did you work with the producer? And I'll use Fred as the example because he's um, the one we did the most work with. And basically, he would take the demo tapes that we had made that sounded like crap and imagine like how the song could be done up in the styles that were popular and required of us at that time and he worked with the studio to schedule and arrange everything to happen he made he was the liaison between the label and the studio and he would work with us intensively on you know how is this going to sound in terms of style where we wanted to land it in terms of genre um, he brought a lot of his own equipment. He had his own synthesizers that we used uh, that we didn't have. He did. Um, he had this Yamaha rack of FM synths, like a, a whole, it was this weird rack mount thing that had a, a row of as many individual FM synth units as he wanted to put into it. And he, we had never seen such a thing. So he brought that, for example. And then uh, he worked with me on the vocals, like at the time, um, I've never been a great singer, and at the time I was a you know, borderline bad singer, and he worked with me really hard, hours and hours and hours, to just get a few decent takes. And there was no auto-tune, you know, so you had to sing it right. <laughs> um, and he was the one who sat there listening, said, nope, he didn't quite hit that note, try it again, right? So that was one of the things he did. Um, but the biggest thing Fred did that... I think, made the albums um, what they are, especially the first one, is he knew and connected us with 
um, a mix engineer, a guy named Roy Shamir. And I credit him with the lion's share of how that album eventually came to sound. Because when we were done recording, they sounded like, eh, you know, something. And by the time Roy got done uh, mixing them with us, it was something completely different. He didn't just set sound levels, right? He did all kinds of stuff that was just amazing. Um, like, you know, compression and multiband. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and, you know, sideband chained, yeah. key gated okay. compression of synthesizers. It, it, I mean, the songs changed so much from the recording to the end of the mixing that I have to say that Roe's con contribution was at least as large as Fred's. Oh, okay, yeah, because mix engineer is another thing. I'm not quite sure what they do. Again, different mix engineers are completely different from others, and Rowie was very, very creative. Oh, uh, that just makes it so complicated. Yeah. Well, and it changes over time, too. Like, I mean, yeah, that's also true. A mix engineer isn't as necessary now as it was then. Yeah. You can still do it, but it isn't so difficult to, to work without one as it used to be. Um, he's the one who, you know, said, okay, here's a straight drum beat. Let's put a bunch of syncopated delays on it and then filter out all of the low end of this drum loop and then send it through a key gated compressor to have a synth that triggers along with it. You know, that's pretty deeply creative stuff, stuff that you would normally assume that only the band themselves are doing. Yeah, I would. And so I give a lot of credit to Roey for all that he did. And I also, continuing to answer your question about, you know, what was Fred's role, he's the one who had the belief that we should get someone like that. And he's the one who knew how to get somebody like that. And he's the one who made it happen. And that's where, that's what a producer really does, is they have a high level vision of what we should do to make this music what we really want it to be and is, be as good as possible. And then they make those things happen. A band could, in theory, have those same ideas, uh, but often they won't. And the band has to worry about other things. You know, the band has to worry about if the lead singer and the, and the keyboard player aren't getting along. The band has to worry about talking to their manager about how they need to pay their rent and they don't have any money. The band has to worry about getting clothes for the performances for the tour that they're about to do. Right. Um, it, what we need a producer for is to worry about all the thing, the high level stuff of making an album. Yeah, that really seems like that's a role that has changed drastically. Very much, yeah. yeah. And it's mostly changed because of technology, because the producer yeah. is no longer necessary, but they can still be just as beneficial as they ever were. Yeah. I think that pretty much answers my question. Good. It kind of it kind of goes with, um, I'm kind of fascinated all the like invisible people, because you think mm -hmm. information society, mm -hmm. you think, all right, well, here's the four members, but nobody thinks about the engineer or uh, mix engineer, you know, producers or whatever. I mean, some people do, but yeah, I take uh, your point is well taken. Yes, yeah, that's also kind of why I'm reaching out to you in the first place with the uh, game stuff. That's my go-to. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into that. Um, yeah, that's uh, the game stuff is honestly more interesting to me as well. How, okay, so Scooby Doo was your first game, but it was like a a test or something. Like, how did you get into that? Yeah, um, I mentioned to you briefly that it was more like a test. And what I meant by that was, um, well, I'll, it's part of the story of how I got into working on games at all. And I'll just tell the whole story, which is... Yeah, that's, that's what I'm asking, yeah. Yeah, in the spring of 93, um, Paul decided he wanted to quit the band. Um, and our label dropped us. So everything was changing. And I thought, well, I still need to, you know, rely on doing performances in order to make money to pay my rent. But uh, clearly, I need to think about maybe a different career. And I was really into games, and I wanted to live in San Francisco anyway, which at that time was the hub for game development, not, not like now where it's spread out all over the world. And... Um, I thought, all right, I'm going to move to San Francisco and I'm going to try to get into games while also making another album uh, by myself this time. So I was kind of working on both. Uh, I spent a lot of time making new songs and working with my new manager about how to get it recorded as an album and, and onto a label, etc. cetera. I was like, you know, the, the declining phase of, of that part of the band career. 
while trying to ramp up the games career by I did not know how. So I was sort of casting about thinking, how can I get into games work? How can I get into games work? And the damnedest thing happened. Um, you know, in every story, whenever you have somebody tell the story of, you know, how did they achieve the success they had? Almost always, there's at least one point in the story where something happened that they could never have planned for, never made happen. They could have never known that it was going to happen. Yeah, that's um, pretty common, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important to remember because everybody looks at successful people and thinks, oh, I need, I need to see exactly what they did and then I'll do that or... I'll take what they did and apply it to my life. But there's a few places in there where it's just going to be. And then this bizarre random thing happened. You know, you can't you can't just build that into a plan. So instead. You, yeah, you take notes. It's like, I got to be lucky. All right. That's all you know. Exactly. Notes. Right. Here, plan. Step four. Be lucky. Yeah. Right. So one of the things I always say to people is, especially if you feel like you're at the beginning of a whole new, you know, arc of stuff that you want to do. What I always recommend is just do literally everything you possibly can. Any opportunity to get involved with anything that's even vaguely related to what you want to do, just go do it. Even if it seems stupid and useless, because 97 out of 100 of them will be some version of stupid or useless, right? I mean, hopefully half of them will be, eh, that was fun or that was interesting, but it didn't do anything for you. You know, it didn't advance your career at all. But then three of them, three of those 100 things will produce some kind of positive results. And you don't know which three they're going to be. There's no way to know. Right. So you just have to put yourself out in every direction and do everything and watch for where you get a positive response and put your second round of energy back into those things. So here's an example of that is how I got into games. I, I was just flailing around trying everything. And I saw a little ad somewhere for a little class that was being taught at a local city um, college. And... I looked at the name of it, and I just thought, oh, what a stupid, pretentious, dumbass name. What a, this is probably so stupid. It was uh, such, and such, for, such and such for sound and music for the new media. And this is 1994, and you know, people talking about multi... And back then, the term was multimedia, and I was so sick of hearing that word. You know? yeah. It's like words like synergy. You know, <laughs> they got totally played out so hard. Um, but I, I looked at the description of the class, and I thought, God, this looks like bullshit. I don't want to do this. And it's you know $300, which today is like six or 700. But I looked at the name of the guy who was teaching the class. And it was a person who's still a friend of mine today. Like I was just doing email with him this morning named David Havaloso. Oh, yeah. He's currently a professor at USC. I think it's USC or is it? No, no it's, it's the College of Santa Monica. I have another friend who's a game designer who's at USC. And um, at that time, David was the head of audio and music at sega and this is when sega was riding high i mean sega was king of the world at that time and i said to myself jesus i would pay more than 300 dollars just to have lunch with this guy right so i went into it thinking okay the class will probably be at best interesting and at worst a waste of my time but you know i want to talk to this guy he's, he's the head of music at sega he could freaking hire me in theory <laughs> And so, so that's just the random thing that I couldn't have planned for because I didn't know it existed. And that's the thing that I tried because, I don't know, maybe this will be one of the three out of 100 things that produced the results. And turned out it was. Um, I got in there, and, and here's, here's the total random luck. He went around the class asking, okay, tell me about yourself. What's your background in this kind of stuff? What have you done? Why are you interested? And when I told him about the band, he went, what? Really? You're, oh, you're an information. Do you know, I just got done producing an album with two of your songs on it for the Sega CD promotional thing because we had cd plus g graphics on our first album and they were touting the fact that this the new sega cd box could do plus g so they made they put together an album that they like they got all the licensing deals in place to put out an album of nothing but songs from artists that had plus g on it graphics that would come out of the graphics output of cd player because back then all cd players had them yeah yeah i remember that well all of the all of them in Japan, anyway. It was for karaoke originally, but then we found out we could put in pictures, too. So Devo did a few, right? And I think there was a Talking Heads song, and they put on two of ours. And David had just got done putting that album together. He was the producer for that album. Um, so he was really tickled that I was there. It just total random coincidence. You can't plan for that, right? Right. So that very night, the first night, I was talking to him, just saying, hey, David, yeah, cool, Sega, huh, blah, blah, blah. And he said, hey, why don't you come with me? I'm going to go meet my friend, Alex Rudis, 
who's also now still a friend of mine. Uh, I was just helping him do a performance like a week ago, and he lives two blocks from me. And this is 28 years ago. We're still friends. We met Alex Rudis at uh, a local bar, and we just sat there talking. And David goes, so, hey, Alex, you got some work for this guy? And Alex says, well, I don't know, maybe. And so then Alex and I started talking, and Alex wasn't convinced that I would be able to do it, which is fair, because back then, making music for games was a really strange, arcane art. You know, it was stuff that most musicians who had any kind of credibility like I did wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole because it was just so... It was like, you know, building Heath kits. You probably don't even know what that is. I don't. Because I'm, I'm old. But <laughs> it was like, you know, building your own electronics from capacitors and resistors. It was so just janky yeah it was about that level back then yeah yeah like you had to you had to plug a a weird special proprietary circuit board into the top of the genesis that connected with a centronics cable on one end to a db25 on the other that went into your midi interface on your pc and then you used your sequencer to play this genesis like a like a synthesizer instrument i mean it was just it was so fiddly and limited that no other people who are like you know known artists would have been willing to work with it very very few i should say not none and I was one of the people who was actually into that kind of stuff because in our band, we were always doing shit like that. It, it seemed normal to me. And so that was just luck for me too, that the, the nature of doing music for games at the time happened to be exactly the way I was used to thinking about making music anyway. Another thing I couldn't have planned on. Yeah, definitely. The conditions were just right. So Alex gave me two songs to do. He said, well, I'm working on this Scooby-Doo game. Can you please, you know, just give me the MIDI files. He didn't even need me to work with the Genesis yet. He just said, uh, come up with two songs for this Scooby-Doo game. Here's the information about it, and, you know, I'll see. So I gave them to him, and he listened to him, and he said, yeah, okay, that's cool. And that led to a few more things. And he introduced me to his friend Mark Miller, who was the brother of John Miller, who is the person who made Gems. And he was working at the time at a company called Head Games. And that's where I got my first, you know, uh, complete do-all-the-music-for-this-game job. And that was X-Men 2. And that's the end of the story. So imagine if I had tried to plan all that, right? Yeah. yeah. So I talk to people who say, I want to be a successful music artist, and here's my plan. I just think, you know, fuck your plan. That's, that's not what's going to happen, right? Just be open to whatever happens. Watch for where you're getting the positive energy back. Put your second round of energy into those places and be the best person you can be while you do it. That's all you can do. Uh, yeah, that sounds like sound advice to me. So that's how I got into it. You can plan to be a musician. You cannot plan to be a successful musician. That's exactly. my experience. Exactly. You can be a musician easy, and it, it can be very gratifying and, and helpful to you. It can be an important part of your life. Uh, but you can't plan on how other people are going to behave towards what you do. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we mean when we say success. Whenever you say, I want to be successful, you're thinking, I want people to do this. I want people to do that. I want people to feel this way. I want other people to do that. And you can't control other people. Something I know, I think you were 30 years old when you got into the writing games music, weren't you? 31, yeah. Uh, I think that's a little bit older than usual. I, I'm not sure how old uh, David or Alex uh, were. Or well, Mark, they were, they're were. they they're slightly older than me, um, but uh, Mark was younger. But the, the reason for that is that game music hadn't been around very long. Yeah. Like when I was 20, there was no such thing. A lot of the people I talked to were like, they you know into games as a teen and then mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. turn 18 and they're into game industries writing music already right right well and i'm noticing right. oh well you're a bit older than that well, did you right. feel older or i guess not not yet <laughs> <laughs> um when i was 18 games meant space invaders asteroids and pac-man yeah and the thing about that i mean they technically they had music in them you can't say they didn't because that would be kind of artistically blind but at that time, you didn't have people whose job it was to just make the music for the game. Like the, the same software engineer who wrote the code, you know, to track the asteroids was the one who decided to say, well, I'll have one bass note and then I'll have another bass note and they'll get faster as you go. Yeah, that was the music. Yeah. That, that would have been a computer programmer who did that. Not They wouldn't hire some musician to figure that out because it would have been a waste of money. Yeah, it's like, that was like a different era at that, at that point. Yeah, I mean, it got going during the 80s. By the mid-80s, you had people who were specializing in doing music for games. But not when I was 18. Yeah. So for most of you know, people of my era, 
we got into it when the industry caught up with us. I started doing music when I was, well, I started playing piano when I was five and I was singing a lot when I was in high school, but we started the band like a week before my 19th birthday. Um, so I did get into it really young, just in the place where it was available for me to do. It, game work wasn't available at the time. Next question I had was, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Mark, Mark Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, I read, read somewhere that you had a, I think you called it a situation with Mark. Uh, was that just you working at home or what was that? I don't remember what I meant when I said that, but um, I think I can sort of guess. Uh, it's just that I wasn't an employee of his. He had a, he had his own company, but it was you know just very, very small. He mostly worked with one other person, a guy named J Jim Hedges, another friend of mine now. We worked together at Crystal Dynamics later. Because Mark went to work at Crystal Dynamics later. Right. Uh, and he, basically he subcontracted to me uh, on several games. Um, first, the, the X-Men game that we talked about earlier, um, and then some games for Crystal Dynamics, including Gex. Oh, yeah, because you only had one track on Gex, I think. Maybe. I don't remember. But uh, that means it, uh, you definitely mentioned that you were working at home on at least some of these. Yeah, I, I remember going into Mark. Mark had a studio space at the time for doing this stuff. Um, I was used to working at home at the time, but I thought, okay, you know, I'll go in. I think he just wanted to kind of watch me work, and it's kind of like Alex. He just wanted to check me out first. Um, and I went in there, and, like, I remember on the first day, I did something that made made him go, oh, 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 huh, I never thought of that. That, that. Wow, that's really interesting, right? And I think that's when he thought, okay, I, I want to work with this guy. It's just, I never... I just did something that he never would have thought of. And that, that's the best thing about working with other people, you know, is that they're not you. Yeah, definitely. They'll come up with stuff that, that, you know, in theory you could have come up with, but you never would have because you would have come up with other stuff. And it's it's just so creatively stimulating to to bounce off other people's work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was what the day that I did the little tiny loop for the beginning or that where you first put in the cartridge and it starts and there's a modem tone. Oh, yeah, I, do, I do remember that. You know, and then I went into a little short loop for the for the opening menu, and he had just never thought of using the FM synth to simulate a modem tone. It just isn't something that had occurred to him. Um, so I think he was really tickled, you know, that he had started working with somebody who was going to bring something uh, new and different into what he was doing. That definitely does sound like uniquely something you would do or think of. Yeah, <laughs> it does, right? Hey there, quick intermission just to add some context since I hadn't mentioned it before. In 1988, there was a rare, super secret coded message floppy that came with the Information Society uh, eponymous album. This was Kurt's idea. In 1990, there was another program to coincide with NSOC's second album, Hack. Also Kurt's idea. In 1992, the final track on NSOC's third album, Peace and Love Incorporated, was pure text data. Sending this track to your modem would reveal a wild story from an earlier InSoc tour. Kurt organized all of this. Kurt is a nerd and this manifested in some incredibly cool ways. So of course he would come up with a dial tone on the Sega Genesis. Anyway, back to the interview. So let's see, if you were working from home, that means you were bringing all these dev kits home. Yeah. Like, what, what was that like? like? What was your setup? Well, I mentioned it. Uh, a little while ago, um, briefly, when I was saying that it was such an arcane art, you know, uh, the setup was, and I'll just describe it again more slowly. Well, it's just like, this is a lot of junk. You have to have like a dedicated space for it. Like, did you have your own little dedicated room or anything or? Yeah. When I moved to San Francisco, I set aside a room as this is going to be the studio room because I had had a studio in my house since 86, probably even earlier, really. Uh, but so you asked about the setup. So they had to, the company head game, they had to give me a special modified um, Sega Genesis, basically like a dev kit Genesis. Um, I don't know exactly what the, all the differences were, but I know that whatever the differences were, they were necessary to do the work. And there was one tiny little circuit board about two and a half inches long and three quarters of an inch wide. That got that had to be put into the secondary port. There was some tiny little secondary port on this 
dev kit Genesis. I don't think it was on the commercial ones, but I could be wrong. So that had to be in there, and I don't remember why. And it wasn't connected to anything. It was just maybe it was some kind of security thing. I don't even remember. Might have and then, into the bus or something, yeah. Maybe. And then we were given another circuit board that was like five inches long and three inches wide, or maybe four inches wide. And that had to be jammed into the top of the Genesis instead of a cartridge. So it was basically a cartridge. It yeah. performed the same function as a cartridge, but it was an, all the program on the cartridge did is act as an interface. Then that circuit board had a giant ass SCSI connector on it, you know, Centronics type connector, like a big, heavy connector, like so heavy that the cable kind of pulled on the on the little circuit board in a bad way. And it was actually one of the problems with that setup. The cable was too big and clunky for the delicate little circuit board that it was connecting to. But you had to have a cable that on one end was a SCSI Centronics connector, and on the other end was a DB25 connector. Uh, at the time, what we would have called a printer port cable. So it was a, a cable converter. And then that would go into your MIDI interface on the back of your computer. And then you could use your computer's sequencer the way you normally would. It's just you only had one synthesizer you could connect to. And it was the six-voice, four-op FM chip in the Genesis. And that's all you got. See, what I think is interesting is that you remember exactly the limitations you were forced to work with. Mm hmm I do. I mean, when you when you work with them, you you remember because wow, <laughs> it was quite an experience, and I think it was a really good experience. It was a good experience for me creatively, and I say that because what I learned from that experience doing music on the Genesis um, after coming from you know literally top level, big label funded studio projects that took six months to do, and were you know at the time l unlimited recording flexibility and power, you know. A year later, I'm working on a six voice four operator FM chip. And it would have been easy for me to feel like I had come down in the world, but I just didn't because I didn't like the music business and I loved games and this was so fresh and so new and so cool. And I always loved this kind of electronic experimentation synthesizer stuff anyway, that I was really way into it. What was so good about that for me, I realized, is that it's incredibly beneficial to one's creative chops, one's creative abilities to spend some time in a very restricted creative space. Definitely, definitely. I never knew that before until I did that. And I realized that you could, you could apply it to almost anything. You know, you could write a song using only two notes. You could write a short story using only 100 different words. Um, and anytime you do that, it forces you to do stuff with your creative process that you've never done before. And it really expands your mind. Of course, then it feels great to go back out of that restricted space. Um, yeah, definitely. But when I came back out of that space, I found I had I had gained something from being there for a while. Like the the six voices um, for, for your listeners who might not know what six voice four op means. That means six voices means that the synthesizer can only make six different sounds at one time. And four op means four operator frequency modulated synthesis, which um, is just a type of way of making a synthesizer. Well, it means your waveform can only get so complicated. To edit in an example, I randomly generated nine patches of a four-op synth. Here they are. Next, I randomly generated nine patches of a two-op synth. It's a little subtle, but the two-op tends to have a simpler, cleaner sound, closer to a sine wave usually. The four-op can do all that and more. But that is its own rabbit hole, so let's get back to the interview. Of the several types of synthesis, FM is one of them. And so four operator just means it had that number of different tone generators. It had four, and you could combine them in different ways to make different sounds. And that's all you got, six voices, four operators. And you couldn't use all six voices on the music because the game was also running the sound effects. Yep. Using those same voices, right? So you, had, you could only make like between two and four different notes at one time. And you still had to bring across music that's fairly compelling. I mean, knowing that, I invite you and anyone who's, listening, who's hearing this to go back and listen to some of that original Sega Genesis music, like some of the really good stuff, and realize these, these composers made this knowing that they could never have more than six voices happening at the same time, and usually less than that. And your MIDI data had to be restricted. Like you only got about 25 kilobytes, not megabytes, right? 25 kilobytes of information to make an entire song. 
Yeah, that's the yeah. one that bothers me more. Yeah, it's it's intense. I, you know, I, I'm um I'm one of those people who tries to make chip tunes in you know modern day using mm -hmm. modern software. Oh no, no, no! Modern software is all based on having unlimited storage and memory. Oh no, you can uh, make authentic chip tunes that play back on original hardware. They just have better tools for it these days. Oh, I see. So you've got something that actually allows you to remember what the restrictions are and keep them. Yes. Oh wow, that sounds really cool. I mean. I wouldn't want to spend the rest of your life there, but Definitely no, that's but... an example of what I was saying about spending some time in a restricted space, isn't it? Yeah. Great. Like I made this like really cool like dance tune uh, using the uh, Super Nintendo, and it's mm. I could get the samples down, and it still sounded good. But the driver I was using, uh, it did not have space for the arrangement. That had to be cut down way too mm. much. Right, because you you overloaded the limit of how much MIDI data it could hold. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And even on the PS1, you know, when you had a CD drive and, and two whole megabytes of memory just for audio, right? Um, yeah. We still had to, you know, I had to squeeze an entire, every package of music had to fit into less than 500 kilobytes. And, and it had to be able to operate in, you know, like five different modes within that 500 kilobytes. And I'm really, including the sample data. Oh, no. And I'm really proud of, of the, what we pulled off on Soul Reaver and one and two, given you know the the depth and complexity of the music that is there, given the restrictions that we had to work with. Yeah, I think it came out really nicely too. But uh, to go back a little bit, um, working with restrictions, and you seem to be like really excited to work with them. Uh, you were working well, not with... anymore. <laughs> well, at the time. Yeah, at the time. You found it refreshing, I guess, would be the word. Um, yeah, the whole thing of, of getting into games after being in the music business was refreshing in every way. But um, I was thinking... Especially at the time, you know, the San Francisco culture was much more concentrated and identifiable as different from the Los Angeles culture. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. that was so much better for me in every way. But um, something that you got in games music that you d could not possibly get on a CD or in the studio is the dynamic music. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was another big thing for me. I noticed as soon as you got the chance to on X Men Two, yep. you were going absolutely wild with the you know dynamic you know changing soundtrack. Well, I wish I could agree with you there, but I wouldn't call it absolutely wild because we uh, the the limitations I think put it more in the range of uh, interestingly there. <laughs> there there was variation, but it is just that depending on what character you picked, uh, you it would use a different MIDI track and a different sound for the main melody. And that's it. I mean, that's not much. A little hyperbole, but yeah, you, you know, you're going for it. Yeah. But later, I did, you know, lots of much more cool stuff with that. Yeah, making it hard for the people to, like, uh, rip the soundtrack as a whole. <laughs> that, that was not something we were thinking about, but I suppose you're right. I mean, who would have been thinking about it, really? Yeah, nobody. I mean, arguably, that's, like, the wrong way to listen to the music anyway. You're supposed to be in the game, but... Also, it's good music, so I want to listen to it outside the game. Right, right. Um, Sega, Sega was thinking very, very heavily in that way at the time. They started a whole like music studio, and they wanted to start their own music label. And, and they had a bunch of composers, including me, make al like studio albums yeah, based yeah, on the, the, the cartridge music. And they really thought that they were going to become a player in the music industry. Um, I wish, you know, I wish they had asked me because I would have told them no. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> They they lacked people who understood that. Concept. They did pay you for an album, though. Yeah, not a lot, but um, it was work for hire, you know. Yeah, but how, how long did they give you? Uh, I don't actually. I don't think you recall. I don't remember. Because everybody else uh, I talked to, or everybody else that mentioned it, is like, yeah, they were like, uh, you have one month to write an entire album. Right, and for people who came from the music business, that was just stupid. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> because. At first, the, the people at Sega thought that they were just going to record the music out of the back of a Genesis and put it on an album. And thank God they had a few people there like David Havalosa who told them, we can't do that. <laughs> that noisy, you know, low quality output, you can't put that on an album. No, you just can't do that. And then the, the execs went, well, we don't have to pay for this. How much is it going to cost? Well, 
So that was the problem. You know, they weren't used to paying a lot of money. They weren't used to taking a lot of time. And they weren't going to listen to someone say, well, in the music business, it's like this. It was one of the many reasons that their, you know, attempt to start a record label wasn't, was never going to work. What's interesting, though, is uh, in Japan, they actually did have albums that just recorded the game audio. They, the, the Japanese did it much better. And I think they, just the culture surrounding all of this stuff was, made much more sense. And they, they knew what they were doing better. They, they understood the target they were trying to hit much better. In Japan, anyway. I mean, I don't think they were ever able to sell many of their game music albums in the U.S. Yeah, I think you're right. But I know that in Japan, it was a thriving little industry, you know. So I kind of like wanted to ask, like, how did you approach that arrangement album? Was it just like trying to like recreate what you had in the game using like uh, NSOC sound or? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I wouldn't have known how to not sound like NSOC at the time. Um, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I'm saying. Anything that I did at the time would end up sounding pretty similar. Uh, except that a lot of what you hear, and by a lot, I mean the majority of what you hear on our Warner Brothers albums was recorded. Uh, the the recording and the sound design originated with Paul, not me, and his style was quite different from mine. If you listen to the album that I did by myself called Don't Be Afraid, that sounded quite different. Yes. Um, that's more like what I was doing would sound like at the time. So yeah, I don't remember. I mean, the, the only thing I really remember is that I approached it as, I don't have enough time to do this. I got to hurry up. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I... I also have this other stuff I need to do and I really need to make money quickly because I don't have much. And th that's what I was thinking at the time. Hmm, okay. Uh, Mark also uh, contributed one of the songs or worked with you. At least one. Uh, you, mean, you mean one of the songs on the album? On the arrangement album. Yeah. I, is it only one? Pretty sure. I don't remember, but it's at least one. One called Avalon. That was Mark's. Yes. And I had to re-record it, I think. Or maybe he did it. I'd have to listen to it again, and if I listened to it, I could tell you, oh, no, this, this would have been him, or it would have been me. Okay, I'm, listen I'm listening to Avalon, and that's definitely my recording. Mark would have never made it sound like this. In fact, I can recognize the Roland D110 patch that I used. <laughs> yeah, for that, I was just kind of wondering, like, how much was Mark involved? Well, at that time, Mark was... When was that? It, he might have already made the switch to from having his own business to working as the head sound guy at Crystal Dynamics. Um, in which case, he wouldn't have had time to mess with any of this. He would have had a full-time job with responsibilities to that company, and he would not have wanted to have been moonlighting, basically. So if I'm right about that, then he probably didn't have much to do with it at all. Hmm. I, th I think, I mean, I think... David worked with me directly on that, if I recall. Or maybe they went to Mark, and then he... I don't remember. These are not the kinds of things I remember. Yeah, that's fine. Leave me alone. I'm old. <laughs> anyway, the Balls 3DO thing, uh, you ended up taking the music you did from that and releasing it to a fan group. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that sounds familiar. I think it was like the set tape, even. Yeah, it was on cassette tape. Right. I'm kind of wondering, like, why, I guess? Like, I guess uh, it wouldn't really make sense to put that on, like, a you know, actual album through a record label or something, if you even could do that. Um, I arranged those deals so that some of those songs were, in fact, able to be re-recorded and re-released on my solo album. Oh, okay. Um, that, that was part of my agreement with the game company. Yeah, uh, my own notes here are, like, released to a fan group and not Information Society. Uh, yeah, that, well, at the time, I realized it was going to take a long time before I could get this new album recorded and released, and that we had, you know, fans who were still interested, and so I was kind of kind of trying to keep the interest, and this was the early, early, early days of internet promotion, and I was one of the few music artists who was trying to exploit it, because I was a very, very early internet adopter, you know, mid-80s, um, before you could do pictures. You know, before there was anything but text on the internet, I was there for some years. So I built my own website, you know, I taught myself how to do HTML, um, and I tried to maintain a fan group, mostly through IRC, which is something you've probably never used. I have, actually. I've been using right. it up until uh, 2012, I think. Yeah, cool. So as you know, you were probably one of the last people to ever be using it, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm sure there are still IRC servers out there, and people are using them for really cool stuff. But it's not, it doesn't have, you know, millions of users like it did back then. So I was mostly organizing through um, IRC and my website. 
So there wasn't a lot of two-way communication. You know, I tried to do some email, but I couldn't do all that much. And so sometimes I would just want to try to give something out to just sort of, you know, keep people engaged. Um, and I didn't have the means to, you know, print 10,000 copies of something. So I just sort of did stuff at home to small groups of people. And there was a there was a woman in Texas who, for some reason, got all interested in the band and wanted to do this whole like fanzine that was all about information society. Um, but I convinced her instead to make it into a genre zine that's about synth pop in, in the U.S. in general, which I think turned out much better. And she actually, you know, got some visibility for a number of different uh, American synth bands, including uh, Anything Box. Ah, so that's what happened. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying the, you know, that's where they got their big break or anything, but I know that Anything Box was one of the bands that she well, just talked about. Yeah, I just remember that uh, it was a information society fanzine that turned into just a general synth pop fan group and i wasn't sure like what happened there yeah but that explains it so i think in fact i think the the music release that you're asking about was connected to that it was yeah okay oh yeah i found an interview you did uh the year 2000 where you worried about the hollywoodification of games Mm -hmm. do you think that has come to pass or like what are your thoughts on it now uh 20 years later I'm fairly pleased with where things ended up with that. Um, it's it's still something that kind of bugs me. You know, I, I never liked the idea of games as movies because they're not, and they shouldn't be, and they never will be. Um, but w- what bothered me at the time, and I don't think this is as much of a problem now as it was then, is that you had this whole culture of computer software development that was games. And it was being, you know, run into by this other giant iceberg that was the development of movies from the film industry and the you know just the whole philosophy of how to do stuff and the whole way of looking at the world was so completely different um and what bugged me about it so much is that at that time the games industry was already bigger than the film industry in terms of you know money um and yet you had these very successful game developers who were just falling all over themselves like you know immature fanboys to scrape a little bit of attention from from the film industry i want to be a filmmaker like like, dude you're doing something cooler already (laughs) why right and don't fawn to this other industry that's doing something different just do what you do you do it great it bugged me plus uh i felt that the influence of the way of thinking about making films on games was a negative one i think it made games worse and uh, at the time there was a very dark distinction between the two. And trying to make games be like movies was really difficult and the results were not good. Um, you especially see that in the mid 90s with games, uh, you know, like from, I think it was Rockstar, something called Sewer Shark and stuff. Oh and yeah, that stuff, yeah. Catalogs and Dinosaurs and stuff where they, they really just wanted to make a movie. But it wasn't, it was a game. And the, the, the combination wasn't good. You know, it was one of the Ripley's that did not succeed when they were trying to combine her with the alien, you know? <laughs> right. Um, so where are we now? I think we're at, like at the last Ripley, right? Where she's pretty functional. Um, I'm playing Horizon right now, for example, and I feel like I am having an experience that is both successfully narrative and successfully gaming. So I think all turned out pretty well. What was that MMO that never released? You mentioned working on this a few times. Uh, there were two MMOs I worked on that never released. Oh, two of them. Um, but the one you're the one you're thinking of was from a company called Slipgate Ironworks. Um, they got together ostensibly to make an educational based MMO for kids between like ten and twelve. Um, the idea is that we could use the incredible um, raw and compelling experience of gaming for children because kids loved games, you know, and they were getting into MMOs. Um, and everyone was thinking, can't we put some education in here? Like, couldn't we teach kids math by having them play an MMO? I got a lot of smart people together, came up with a lot of smart ideas about how to do it, but ultimately economics kind of killed it. Um, that was right when the, um, global economic meltdown happened. And, um, also the company was started by some venture capitalists who, in hindsight, I realized they kind of wanted to go somewhere and make a company get out of it quick and go back to venture capital with that feather in their cap. Oh, yeah. And they couldn't get out of it. They couldn't get out of it because the economy collapsed and they were stuck. And so eventually they just said, oh, screw this. We're done. You know? Oh, that's unfortunate. 
Yeah, and the other founder was John Romero because the venture capitalist guys needed somebody with game industry credibility so they could say, look, we have John Romero uh, as our, you know, the head of game design. So you don't have to worry about the fact that we're just venture capitalists and don't know how to make games because we have this guy to make games. So those are the three people who started it. So so it was like uh, more of a financial thing and not just like this is an obviously impossible project. Although that could have been this. Was it impossible? I'll never know. Well, but well, definitely the farther we went, the more we realized that the goalposts were much farther away than we ever thought they were. Well, like, uh, the first full time job I ever had, I went to the orientation and they were like, we're doing something that many people have tried to do, but never succeeded. But we're going to succeed. Yeah, a lot of people said that. like, that's a that's a sign we're not going to succeed, isn't it? And then everybody got laid off three months later. Yeah, exactly. If you're going to say that, you have to follow it up with comma, because, colon, right. blah, 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 blah. And if you don't have that, then fuck off. Yeah, that's, so I was wondering if like the MMO was just another case of that or something. But it sounds like just an unfortunate situation. Honestly, honestly, I'm not qualified to make that judgment. Um, and I'm just, I'm just being honest about the limitations of my understanding of things. I don't understand a lot about business, you know? Yeah, that's fair. And running a company and how to keep it afloat. I know that the... The CEO, who was one of the venture capitalists, spent all his time trying to find new funding, which I wouldn't know how to do that. Right. Um, technically speaking, I can say more about the game. Like, well, could we have ever shipped that MMO the way we intended? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's, definitely, that's basically the question. I think it would have taken so long that there's no way that the, the business end of it could have ever worked. Now, I could be wrong about that because of what I was just saying. I don't really understand that side of things very well. But it seems to me, just based on my observation and experience working in other companies, that it would have taken us, you know, seven years to make that game. And I see what happens to projects that take more than two or three years. That in most companies they die because the company says, "Oh my God, we're going to run out of money and go out of business before this is ever done. We got to cut our losses now." I see. I think we're just about out of time. Even though I wanted one more question. One more. I wanted to know how you transition into the technical side because you went from making music to like. Um... I think you described like putting like sound into games so that it like if you're around the side of a wall it'll like uh dampen or whatever something like that um well the example doesn't do much for me but i understand the question and i would say that um it wasn't much of a transition for me in particular uh getting back to something i was saying a while ago i i was just lucky that i was particularly well suited for the state of game audio at the time that i started doing it it quickly morphed into something that, for which I was not all that well suited. But by then, I, you know, I had my, my roots in the industry and I knew how to kind of adapt with it. My main adaptation is that I stopped making music for games and just went more and more into uh, sound design and implementation, uh, which honestly was a much more satisfying career for me because I was always more on the fiddly end of like, oh, here's this one neat sound. I'm going to spend 90 minutes like just perfecting this one synthesizer sound, you know, which... And Paul would look at that and go, oh, what are you doing? We're trying to make music, <laughs> right? And which is a totally fair thing for him to say. Um, so for me, ending up, you know, 20 years later, digging into the, to the wiring of a game to make these sounds behave in a certain specific way, it seemed totally natural. I think it was always probably a, a better career for me. Um, I was always pretty good at singing and performing on stage. And I, I eventually taught myself to be fairly good at lyrics and melody, but uh, I was never that good at recording whole songs. When I say I wasn't good at it, I don't mean I never did anything that turned out good. I mean, it was really hard for me. Paul was prolific. He could just sit down and rattle off songs quickly, and they were good. Uh, I would spend a month making one song, and it was only okay, and it was just like pulling teeth, and it was painful for me. <laughs> So it was just a place where I was working kind of outside my comfort zone. So going over to the technical side actually brought me back into my comfort zone. Interesting. Which is probably the opposite from what most musicians would experience. I it, it depends, because I get the impression that you're a musician who like would be really, really into sound design, which can be the yeah, thing. Yeah, true. Mm. There's... Yeah, right. And, and Paul was totally the opposite. He hated sound design. He only liked to use the patches that came with the synthesizer. And I would always kind of tease him about, Jesus Christ, Paul, we're putting songs on our album that are like on the demo ROM. And that really bugged me. But 
he didn't see the problem with that. And, you know, from his point of view, he's yeah, there's, right. there's two different philosophies on that. And then there's some people that make entire songs mm. that is just sound design. And I think you're comfortable on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm much more towards that end. And when you do that and you're working all by yourself, it just becomes so painful. You know, because everything takes forever in a day. That's why I liked working with Steven Seibold on my um, Don't Be Afraid album, is that he was just so good at cutting through all of the rabbit holes that I would go down. And he would just say, yeah, but look, let's do this. There, that sounds good. Great, great. You know, and he wasn't doing what Paul did, which is to just try to ignore sound design. He was just really smart uh, about finding the sounds to use and just going with them. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I really, I really liked working with Steve, Stephen Seibold. He did a band called Hate Department. Um, and uh, working with him was great. Just, just great for me because he's... Uh, so intelligent about how he goes about making music and such a nice guy. Hey there, editing Anasai here again. Uh, that's all for this interview. Uh, however, I had interviewed Kurt previously for my Gems video back in 2017. This was just for my own research at the time, but it has a few fun stories that, with Kurt's blessing, I'd like to share with you today. The audio was a bit rougher, and also I had to re-record all of my own parts due to an error I made at the time. But uh, with all that said, uh, let's set up the scene. I was showing Kurt my recreation of gems and the software environment as it would have been used at the time, and he was reacting to it. So upon seeing the compiler stage... Oh, the compiling stage, right. That, that's it. It made all those ASM files, and those were the things you turned in. And I was, I remember I was sending those things to Mark and whenever things got too large so that it would take too long to send over the modem, um, we'd have to talk about, you know, ways of breaking it down. And at that time, too large meant like more than 200 kilobytes was considered, you know, too large to send because our effective, you know, transfer rate was typically something like 2400 baud or something like that. But as for how this got used, uh, in X Men, you had a you had a soundtrack that changed depending on what the game did. Yeah, uh, it was changing based on the character that you were playing. So the that, that was my idea. The standard thing those days was to have different music depending on where you were, uh, which is fine. But um, I I made a bunch of different versions that would run concurrently, um, not concurrently, but. Uh, would run optionally um, depending on a value that was fed back into the gem system. So yeah, there, there has to be some kind of data variable connection. I don't remember how that worked. But I would set up uh, different MIDI tracks that would then connect to different patch numbers. And the one that got played was dependent on the data coming back from the game about the ID number of the character the player had currently selected. But yeah. I, but I really don't remember how that system worked. Do you? Yeah, it was the uh, mailbox system, Mbox. Right, Mbox. Yep. You can store values in there, uh, read them from gems, and then change what plays back. Yes. Yes, that, I remember that now, because I had this idea for using the, the Mbox to create this sort of weird self-looping, regenerative, random music generator once, but uh, I never actually did it, because doing that all through the, through the Mbox would have been kind of ridiculous yeah i had the same idea as soon as i saw it yep uh, another neat feature that uh gems had is you could use midi controller data to control a surprising number of variables on the hardware uh, did you make much use of that i did actually i made pretty heavy use of the controller data um in fact uh that was how i managed to <laughs> i was working at home all right and the game team was over at head games and that is how I managed to crash the game for all the developers just from submitting music assets to them remotely, <laughs> uh, which is sort of the most leg legendary crash I can, I've ever heard of. Um, because one of, the, one of the things you could do is you could send through a particular MIDI controller value um, that had a range of something like you know, 5 to 12, and it controlled the pitch of the playback of the, the simulated sample 
sound that the Genesis can play. You know about that, right? Yeah. So I was using that because, you know, for, for 1994 with the Genesis, it, didn't, it was usable. It didn't sound that bad. And I found that there was this controller that would control the playback pitch um, so that you could play back the sample at a different pitch from that at which it was originally given to the Genesis. And I looked in the manual. So, yeah, I remember this now. I did have the manual. And it, it described that. So I started using it. And it said that the range was something like 5 to 12, with the lower numbers being the lower pitch. Just, so just out of curiosity, I thought, well, what happens if I go below 5? And I expected that the sound would simply fail to play. But what happened is that it just kept getting lower. And I thought, whoa, this sounds great. So I submitted assets to them with this particular sound, sample sound, that with that value set to 2. And apparently, it wasn't crashing so much as what it was doing is it was making the game slow down. It took them days to figure it out, but what was happening was that as soon as I set that value to 2, it didn't just slow down the audio system. The whole damn machine had to slow down to wait for the audio system because of some kind of you know blocking, non-threaded execution that the device did. So they'd be playing along, and everything's fine, everything's fine, and then suddenly they start this level... And as soon as that sound would hit, oh, the game would start to go, doo, 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 and it would run at like one-third normal speed, and they had no idea why that was happening, and they were tearing their hair out. And finally, Mark calls me and says, okay, they figured out the problem, and it's you. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not a great idea to go outside of those recommended values when you're so close to the metal. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm all about, right? And that's the end of this video. Kurt is one of the four members of Information Society. They're still active with their latest album being a year and a half old at time of recording. You can buy it here at their Bandcamp. Then you can follow them on their YouTube channel, and their Facebook page, and Instagram, and Twitter. And if you haven't seen it already, I just did a video exploring Kurt's game music. All of these are linked in the description, and maybe a few of them on screen as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.